Okay, good afternoon. You're all still here, even though it's the last session. Who is asleep? Okay, that's uh, it's less than half, so we're good. We're good. <clears throat> okay, so uh, my name is Magnus Hagener. So yeah, I'm here to talk about Postgres 11, which doesn't exist. Uh, so this whole thing is just going to be fiction. Some of it is going to be slightly more likely fiction, and some is going to be less likely fiction. Uh, but none of this is actually certain at this point. So who's already running Postgres 11 in production? <laughs> One person put his hand up and actually looked serious. No, he was joking. Okay, so only Mina. Not even you, Dimitri? Okay. <clears throat> well, I am running Postgres 11 in production. Don't be like me. I am not running it on, on very critical systems, I'll tell you that. But if you, for example, uh, go visit my blog, that's served out of Postgres 11. And if it's down, it's somebody else's fault. It's not Postgres's fault. Uh, so uh, as I said, my name is Magnus Hagener. Uh, I work for a company called Red Pill Linpro. We are an open, services, uh, open source services and consultancy business in Scandinavia. Uh, do uh, sort of uh, training, consulting, 24-7 support things around Postgres and other parts where uh, I am the lead of the database offer. Uh, I'm based in Stockholm, in Sweden myself, and I just came down with a group of people here who were up visiting us for Nordic PG Day two days ago, uh, the sister conference. Uh, within the Postgres project, I'm also a member of the core team, the project steering committee. Uh, I'm one of the committers who are supposed to be working on finalizing Postgres 11, uh, but now I'm here instead and making other people do that work. Uh, and I am currently on the board of Postgres Europe, uh, which is the sort of organization that uh, user group umbrella that financially backs this conference and others. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, we are here to talk about Postgres 11. Uh, as I said, Postgres 11 is not done yet. It's in fact pretty far from being done so far. Uh, the feature set that we have is quite unclear. There are things in there, there, there are a number of things have been committed, a number of things have not been committed but are being worked on. Uh, we don't know how many of the things that are being worked on that are currently being reviewed will actually be included. Uh, and we don't know how many of the things that have been included that will be removed. Uh, we can still find issues with the things that have been included that are big enough that the general consensus is it's better to remove it and wait until Postgres 12. Uh, rather than put it into Postgres 11. Uh, <clears throat> at this stage of development, this is not an uncommon thing. So we will go through things that may not end up in the end. And of course, there is well over 100 features still in the queue that we just don't know about. Uh, if we look at the development schedule <coughs> excuse me, of Postgres 10, it started in August of 2017 when uh, sorry, of Postgres 11, when Postgres 10 was branched off and we created a, a special branch in the Postgres source repository saying this is version 10, and we relabeled the master branch in the repo saying this is Postgres 11. And basically that's when we started reviewing and applying patches that have been queued up that are not included in Postgres 10 that was released in September, but that will be included here. There was a commit fest, as we call them in Postgres. That's our iterative process. We run uh, a month approximately, worth of development work. And then we spend a month reviewing that work and getting it committed to the code base. <clears throat> and we run four of these. The first one ran in September, second one ran in November, third one ran in January. Uh, and we are right now running the fourth one that started at the beginning of March. Uh, the fourth one is typically longer. It'll probably take at least two months uh, because there are, this is the last chance. Okay. Any code uh, or I should say any, any larger feature that has not been put into this uh, commit fest number four will not make it into Postgres 11. Even though it's almost half a year away from our targeted uh, release date, which is in September, if someone comes up with a brilliant feature and it's anything but super trivial, it is already too late. Uh, so we're going to finish commit fest four sometime in April. Um, sometime after that, there's going to be a beta version, there's probably going to be a second beta version, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, <clears throat> and we're hoping, again, to make a release approximately in September. Uh, so what are we going to put in this release? Uh, for those, who has seen me do one of these new version of Postgres talks before? Surprisingly few. OK. <clears throat> I'm going to do it the same way that I usually do it, except I'm actually going to use new features this time, the ones that are in 11. 
Uh, I tried to split this up a little bit across areas, uh, features mostly oriented to DBA and administration, uh, others mostly oriented to SQL and developer, but the only real difference there is, I would say, SQL exposed functionality, things you do through your connection, through your SQL statement, because really, what is the difference between a DBA and a developer today? Well, unless you are working in one of these wonderful siloed organizations where the only way that these people talk to each other is you know, through fax, uh, then there really isn't that much of a difference. Then, of course, we have backup and replication, typically its own thing. There always happens things in Postgres. And finally, uh, there is a lot of interesting things coming out in Postgres 11 specifically around performance features, uh, which, of course, everybody except the hardware salespeople like. Right? Newer databases, you all want them to go faster. Uh, <clears throat> so, let's dig in and look at a few of the things uh, on the DBA and administration side. And to make it easy for myself, sort of when I started this, uh, the first slide that I had in my slide deck about Postgres version 10 was the addition of uh, Scram authentication. So the new, more secure type of doing authentication. So I'm going to start with Scram again, so I can keep the first word from my previous slides. Uh, and uh, Postgres 11 adds something called Scram channel binding. So Postgres 10 added Scram, which again is the secure replacement for MD5 passwords. Uh, salted challenge response authentication method using standard functionality. Uh, who is using Scram today on their Postgres system? Ouch. No one. Okay, who is actually using Postgres 10? Okay, you guys should all investigate using Scram. Maybe it's not the right tool for the job, but you should investigate it. Uh, Postgres 11 adds the ability to do something called channel binding. What that basically guarantees, it adds a guarantee that you are talking to the correct server with your authentication. It can prevent the man in the middle attack. Uh, the way that it works is it extracts information from your TLS channel, so your encrypted channel, but it ensures that the receiving Postgres server can't, or, or the, the receiving end that you're talking to, can't take your credentials and send them somewhere else, even if it's inside of the connection. So it guarantees the other end is the one that it's supposed to be. And there are two different ways of doing it, but they both rely on TLS, meaning they're looking at, for example, the certificate of the connection or the encryption key of the connection and binds that sharp to the authentication. Uh, so if you are operating in, in an, an sort of exposed environment, this can further increase the security of using Scram uh, and your general authentication level. Uh, next thing I'll mention around the DBA side is that you can now configure the size of the WAL segment in Postgres without recompiling Postgres. You've been able to change it before, but nobody really likes to recompile Postgres for their uh, production environments. Uh, the default here is still 16 megabytes. Uh, there are two reasons you might want to change it. If you have a very high uh, generation of transaction logs, just firing off your archive command every 16 megabytes can just end up with too much overhead. So you can increase the size of these files to make it run more seldom and get more performance out of it. Or if you are using Postgres in a really resource-constrained environment and you want to make it smaller. Because right now you can't run Postgres with a really small transaction log directory. Even if you only generate a few kilobytes of transactions per day, you need these 16 megabyte files. In this case, you could drop it down to just one megabyte files and save some space. I think the really interesting part of it is not going to be making it smaller. I think that people are going to be interested in is making them bigger. But there are exceptions to every rule. Um, who in here today is using pgstat statements to look at their database? Awesome. Who is taking snapshots of pgstat statements and storing it for later analysis? OK, just very few of you. If you do, the big change to pgstat statements is that the query ID, which is the hash value for your query, is now 64-bit instead of 32-bit. That means two things. First of all, it means if your queries were sort of disappearing and reappearing in your pgstat statements, as can happen, uh, the likelihood of getting collisions is significantly smaller. Uh, in the current versions, it, you reach 25% risk of a, uh, of a collision after approximately 50,000 unique query strings. Uh, in Postgres 11, that will be about 3 billion unique query strings. If you have more than 3 billion unique types of queries in your application, you might want to sort of consider how you generate your queries. Um, I hope nobody's manually typing those. 
But what it also means that if you are snapshotting this data and storing it somewhere, you now need to snapshot 64 bits worth of data, not 32. And if you, like, you just need to expand your snapshot tables as well. There are other tools that will snapshot this data for you. Those tools are going to be needing a new version, and you're going to remember to upgrade to that version. Otherwise, you can get really strange results if you end up with a tool that truncates, for example, the hash value. Normally, you would hopefully get an error saying it's out of bounds. But a tool might truncate. In that case, it's just going to be broken. Um, for those of you who tune your queries by using set statistics, which often helps, uh, by telling the Postgres optimizer to look at more of your data, for example, to get a more representative value. Set statistics now has support for expression indexes. Uh, in 10 and earlier, to use set statistics, you used it on a column basis. right? You told me this table, this column, look at more data for it. You can't really do that for an expression index, because it, it's not based on columns. It's based on the result of an expression. So in instead, we can now use it on a, put it on an index where we say alter index, alter column. So we've added the concept of column to an index here. But you have to use ordinals, in this case, column number three, because these, the columns here in the index uh, don't actually have a name. But number three here means we're going to look at this one. So that, it makes no sense to do it on the Y, because that's a real column. We can just use alter table and access the column. But this one is the, an expression. So we say the column three set statistics 1,000 will then increase the sample rate of the result of this expression to give you a chance to get better query estimates uh, when you're uh, doing it on these things. Uh, if anyone is using the PG Prewarm plugin that exists, which basically lets you uh, preload data into the Postgres buffer cache to make it look like it did before. In Postgres 10 and earlier, you might, you know, I'm going to do service. You run PG Prewarm to dump the list of what's in the cache, and then as soon as you start Postgres, you can run it again to load that data back in the cache so that your application doesn't have to wait for it. Or you can use it to synchronize cache content between nodes, things like that. Uh, it now has an automatic mode where it starts a background worker that at regular intervals dumps the, the list of what's in your buffer cache to a file. It doesn't dump the contents. It just says, you know, these tables, these blocks are currently in the cache. And by default, it will snapshot this every five minutes. And if you restart Postgres, as Postgres starts up, it'll take a look at this list of what was in the cache when I shut, close to when I shut down, and it will preload that data into the cache as the system starts. So it can let you deal with restarts and things like that in a more automatic fashion while still retaining the ability to keep your, your cache uh, closer to what it was before the restart. Because I'm sure anyone who has uh, worked on a really busy Postgres system know the wonders of cache hit ratio after you did restart. Right? It's another way to help that. It's, I mean, it's not going to be exactly the same because it might be five minutes old data. But if what the, the sort of average contents of your buffer cache changes massively within five minutes, you probably don't have that high cache hit ratio in, in the first place. So it can be a really uh, useful and interesting addition uh, when going through those. Uh, so moving on to a few of the things at the SQL and the developer side. Because uh, I've noticed from previous talks as well, there's a lot of people here who are, uh, for some of these things, I think we have more sort of SQL level developers here. Uh, so let's add a couple of things for you guys. Some of them are really exciting. We now have support for SHA-2. OK, maybe that's not the most exciting one. Uh, but if you were using MD5, uh, particularly in people, there are security certifications and there are security environments where you are not allowed to use MD5. Uh, there are some of these standards, uh, particularly in the US, but of course, as Europeans, we import the bad standards from the US, right? And we build our own bad standards on top of that. But we're literally, you are not allowed to use MD5, even if you're using it in a secure way. If it's even there, you're not allowed to use it, period. Uh, so for that, we've just added the shot. There's a SHA-256, there is a SHA-384, there is a SHA-512. That'll just give you a bigger and better hash. Uh, and we've seen cases, you know, there, there are organizations that will literally go to, you know, your GitHub repo and do a grep for MD5. And if it's MD5 in there, then by definition, your system is insecure. There are many secure ways to use MD5, but this will get you out of both the cases where people do that and the cases where MD5 simply isn't good enough. Now, the interesting thing is Postgres has obviously had these SHA functions for a long time. 
they were not exposed at the SQL level so that you could use them. Uh, so the entire feature was just take this thing that we have and let you use it. <laughs> you know, you're welcome. Uh, Will mentioned this earlier in his talk this morning, uh, this concept of domains in Postgres. They've had a few limitations that have been lifted. Uh, you can now create arrays of domains, which you couldn't do before. So if you had created your domain, so it's sort of your attached uh, constraints to a data type, you couldn't create an array of that. But now you can. And you also could not create domains over composite data types. So you could create a domain on top of an integer. You could create a domain on top of a string. But you couldn't create a domain on top of a composite data type that you created yourself. And you know, the way that Postgres normally works is you can use any data type at any place. Right? So this just makes that possible as well for domains. Uh, but what's probably the most exciting thing uh, for SQL developers, and, and at the SQL level, uh, to me, <laughs> depends on who you are, in this version is the addition of basically full SQL 2011 support for window classes. Uh, who has ever used a window query in Postgres or other databases? Okay, that's good. This, this number of people is increasing. We like that. It's a really powerful way to query your data. Postgres 11 will add the ability to do range between queries with window queries, whereas previously it could only count rows. And we also add the window exclusion clauses, where you can, for example, exclude the current row. If you're doing you know, a sum across rows, you can say, do all the rows except mine. Like, do two before me and two after, but not me. And you can use them to break ties if you're doing certain types of queries. So what does this actually mean? Well, I'll show you with a quick example. This is a stupidly simple query, of course. I have a table that just has the numbers 1, 3, 5, 7 in it. I use generate series to create it. You should also use generate series. Uh, and then if you look at it, we can see the first one is the, the one that we've had since before in Postgres. Right? We're setting sum i over order by i, rows between two preceding and two following. So if you look at, for example, the three here, it's going to, this sum is going to be the two rows before and the two rows after. So it's going to be the one plus the three plus the five plus the seven. Right? Two before, but this one didn't exist. Go down to the 25, that's going to be this, plus this, plus this, plus this, plus whatever the one after that is. Okay, this is a classic sort of sliding window in window queries. This we already had. The thing that's new here is we can also say sum i over order by range, order by range instead of rows, between two preceding and two following. That says we're now looking at values up to two before. So when we start looking at the three here, for example, we're going to look at values that are two before and two after, which means one and five. So here, we're only summarizing the one plus the three plus the five to get this value. And for this row, well, two before five is three, two after five is seven, so we're only going to look at these rows to gener generate the 15 here. Obviously, doing exactly that is kind of a, a ridiculous way to query it, but there are a lot of cases where you might want to say, I want to sum everything until I go back to a certain value. Uh, this is going to be somewhat data type dependent, of course. We have uh, basic support for all the numerical data types. Uh, I think we've seen support added for uh, date times. So you can say, you know, by day, go back to a day, things like that. Uh, <clears throat> this really makes the, the range a lot more powerful uh, to specify in your values. Uh, and the other thing that we can do with them is that we can use this exclude uh, keyword. So here's the same queries again, but I've added exclude current row. So again, in the first one, we are querying rows between two proceedings. So if I go to the five here, for example, it will include the one and the three. It'll skip the five because that's the current row, and the seven and the nine, which makes it 20. And same thing for this one here. It does the range, so it only looks at the three, the five, and the seven, but it skips the five because that's the current row. Uh, and they're similar. There are a few other constructs that you can put around the exclude to exclude based on different criteria. Uh, for example, to break in ties. Uh, but the general idea is you can both define your range, and then you can remove, make a hole in the range and remove some things in the middle of it. Uh, so window queries were already, I'd say, quite powerful. Uh, and this makes them really even further there. Uh, there was at least one, and uh, for the moment I forgot which one it is, but as far as I know, there's one, at least one thing in here that no other database does yet, but it's in the standard, which is very unusual. 
some of the others have been in the, in the major databases for a while. But they do, again, enhance it a lot. Uh, the other big thing that I would put out at the SQL level is that we now actually have stored procedures. And a lot of people go like, hang on, hasn't Postgres like selling argument against, for example, MySQL for 20 years been that we had stored procedures? Well, we had functions. We had stored functions. And we had stored functions that returned void, which is almost the same as a stored procedure. But the SQL standard actually has a definition of a stored procedure that uses something called call to activate it. We didn't support that. You did select and the name of a function that might return void, but you still had to put the select in there. So one of them is that, which also lays the foundation for a number of other things that we will be able to do with stored procedures we just don't know yet. Some of it's in the queue for 11, maybe. Some of it might be in 12. What it also gives us is transaction control, which is something that a lot of people have asked for. The ability to do commit and rollback inside of a procedure. This is not supported with a function because you do select something, Postgres will wrap that in a transaction and you can't do anything about it. You can create save points, but there is always an outer transaction sitting around all of this. And this is probably I say, the biggest change in reality that comes with these stored procedures, uh, because really, who cares? The syntax is not that important. So for example, we can now create, as you see, this looks a lot like saying create function. In this case, we say create procedure, my proc, language, PLP, GSQL, as, begin. But the difference here is I do an insert of one, then I can actually put a commit here. Anybody who has ever migrated a system from Oracle has probably done that, and it didn't work. Well, now you can put it there, and it works. And then I do another insert, and then I do a rollback. You couldn't do this before either. So what's going to happen in reality here is when Postgres calls into your procedure, there will be a transaction. When it hits the commit, it will commit that transaction and open a new one for the next command. It'll run this in a new transaction, and then it will roll that back. Um, so how we use this, well, we simply say, call my pro. And you can do that from your application as well, obviously. Uh, just use the call, give it the name. Uh, you can, of course, have parameters to the function as well. I just don't have them in my example. And as we can see here, what this actually returned is I only have the one in my table because the first one was committed, the second one was rolled back. And that's something we simply couldn't do before. Even though, yeah, we did have our stored functions, they could solve a lot of problems. But this opens up a new set of problems that we can now sort, uh, solve within a stored uh, procedure instead of having to rely on doing lots of back and forth between the server and the client, which is obviously good for performance reasons. Let's talk about backup and replication. We've had, I think, every single Postgres release since 8, or maybe 8.1, has added something to our replication. Most of them has added something big. Some of them has added something small. Uh, surprisingly enough, Postgres 11 doesn't actually add anything major to the replication. But you guys weren't using Postgres 10 yet, so you can still sort of rely on, on the major additions in Postgres 10. Uh, but it does add one thing that I uh, personally find very interesting. I've seen it uh, referenced. Uh, Hanu, for example, mentioned it in his talk, uh, the lack of uh, failover slots, uh, where you have a logical replica and physical at the same time. You fail over, and you lose track of where your logical replica was. Now, it doesn't actually solve the problem. Uh, but uh, there has been added support for something called the ability to advance a replication slot. This is just an API function that lets you move the replication slot, but it lets you move it without consuming the data. And the idea here is a tool running in front of Postgres, whether it's like a replication management tool like Patroni or Rep Manager, will be able to keep the replication slots in sync across nodes. Again, it's infrastructure. Uh, it's really not normally designed for you to just sort of write your own scripts on top of? You can, uh, but if you're building replication systems to solve this problem, you know, it's much easier to use a system that somebody else wrote, uh, because this is hard. But it does allow you the ability to keep your slots in sync across nodes. And it's very simple. You can now take, for any replication slot, you can just say, select PG replication slot, advance, name of the slot, transaction log position, and it moves there. It can only ever move forward. This can also be a way to get around if you have a standby that's dying uh, or, or something and you want to move the replication slot forward. Now, if your standby is never going to come back, you should just delete the replication slot. If your standby has no other way to catch up, well, if you move the replication slot forward, 
the standby is now dead, you just killed it <laughs> because you removed data that it needed. But you might have a situation where the standby can catch up by fetching data from your log archive. And by then moving the replication slot forward on your master will make sure that you don't run out of disk space on the master because of the replication slot blocking while rotation. Uh, and to be honest, that's the only thing I found so far in replication that, that felt worthwhile to mention. Sorry. Um, but the good thing is, I'm only like halfway through my time, and I've already hit the part that's about performance. There are a lot of interesting things uh, happening in uh, Postgres version 11 when it comes to this. Uh, there are a couple of smaller things, and there are a couple of very big blocks. Uh, one of them is things that happen in Postgres when it comes to parallelism. Postgres 9.6 added parallel query, so the ability to use more than one CPU to run the same query, right? Who had good use of Postgres query parallelism on Postgres 9.6? That is like two or, and there's a lot of people who go like, eh, maybe a little bit. In truth, Postgres 9.6 was quite limited in what it could do with parallelism. Uh, particularly because every parallel query had to be rooted in a sequential scan, so you had to look at large amounts of data. If you had a use case that hit this, it worked really well. If you didn't, it didn't help you at all. Postgres 9.6 uh, made, uh, sorry, Postgres 10, in my view, is the one that made parallelism really useful, because suddenly a whole new set of queries could just automatically parallelize and just run faster. Who has had use of parallelism in Postgres 10? Okay, that's a few more. It's still not that many. Oh yeah, you guys weren't running Postgres 10 yet, that's it. <laughs> or you just didn't check your queries. Or you didn't remember to increase the total number of parallel workers in your system to actually use it. Something like that. It's worth looking over. Uh, now Postgres 11 will make parallelism even better because obviously there are things that we still couldn't parallelize. Uh, there are a bunch of general enhancements. For example, we have something called parallel append plan nodes. Probably tells you exactly what it does, doesn't it? Uh, it's a bunch of new types of queries where basically we can read data from two places and put the data together uh, in sequence, whereas previously we were just like, ah, that's too complicated, we can't do that. Uh, it does support parallel aware hash joins. So if you're hash joining uh, two tables, it can in a smart way split this across multiple uh, sessions to do it. Uh, more complicated than you'd think. Uh, but it has a couple of very visible things. For example, you will be able to have a parallel create index. So your create indexes can run a lot faster because a general create index can often be CPU bound. Sometimes you're IO bound, right? You can't read or write your data fast enough. Parallelism doesn't help you at all. Uh, but if you're CPU bound, create index can become significantly faster. This only currently works for B tree indexes. So if you're creating advanced things like GIN or JIST-based indexes for you know, JSON or PostGIS or RANGES or something, they're still not going to be parallelized. Uh, and to control this, there is a new parameter called uh, max parallel maintenance workers equals two, which is the default, saying that by default, a create index can use two CPUs. If you increase it more, well, you can use even more CPUs. Uh, at some point, this one is going to cut in. So when you use that, and particularly if you increase this, you will reach a point where it becomes wasteful because you become I.O. bound. Then you're better in, in reducing the number of workers to leave the CPU to do other things and, and just less coordination because obviously the total work spent is more if you parallelize. Right? But the idea is you can do it at the same time. But if you're hit by a different bottleneck, that doesn't actually help you. Um, these are big things, and we do, I don't think we know yet, in particular, exactly what like, these things are going to mean for real-world queries. Uh, but it's chipping away at the types of query plans that Postgres has that it is unable to parallelize. I would expect something else is going to be removed in Postgres 12. And eventually, we're going to be able to parallelize almost everything. Uh, another big thing that entered Postgres in version 10 was declarative partitioning. Right. Postgres has had partitioning for a long time right, with exclusion constraints. Uh, and anyone who's worked with it knows that wasn't too much fun, was it? Like the syntax was horrible. You had to do a lot of things your own, on your own way. And it didn't really scale that well. Uh, so Postgres 10 added declarative partitioning, which added a syntax that was much easier to work with. 
and it added a bunch of basic partitioning functionality. But really the main thing that partitioning in Postgres 10 did was it added a whole bunch of infrastructure that Postgres 11 could build on. Right? Most of the benefits of the declarative partitioning aren't actually in Postgres version 10. But Postgres 11 fixes a number of things in this and enhances a number of things. Uh, for example, we now have the ability to set a default partition. It's very simple. If we have our table, I can just you know, create table, something, partition, all of P, and instead of saying for this range or for this list, I can just say default, which means that any row you try to insert into the table that doesn't match any partition you've defined will go into this partition. Uh, and, uh, uh, you can avoid the classic problem of, oh man, somebody forgot to add the partition for the new month and the entire application stopped working, right? It's still not great that it collects it in this random other partition, but it's probably better than your application not working. Most things are better than that. Of course, the other problem when that has happened is how do you get that back out to the right place once you've created that partition? Well, then we get to the next one, which I think is a, a really major lacking in previous Postgres, which was we now allow an update to move rows. In the old partitioning, if you updated the partition key so that this row should now be in a different partition because of the range or the list, Postgres would just throw an error and your update would fail. So you had to manually go in and delete it and then insert it again and then it would send it off to the other partition. Obviously not very user friendly and it really took away the whole idea behind partitioning is that your application shouldn't have to care, right? And suddenly it had to care. It's a pretty major flaw. Uh, now you can. Now you can say update. And it will move it to the other one. Now there are some concurrency issues around this. Uh, currently, the way that it looks, we'll see what, what happens long term. But uh, what it does is, in, in the simplest form, it does detect that you are doing this, that you're, it's going to move. And it does a delete and an insert for you. Again, you just don't have to care. But that means that there, there can be a concurrency problem between the check and the delete and the insert, and it might actually fail. Uh, in particular, if you have concurrent activity inserting into the table, for example, while you're also trying to update something in there, it might fail on a unique constraint. It's not going to corrupt your data or anything. You, you can end up with an error. Um, how likely that's happened, I really don't know. Nobody's really used this yet, except for my blog, which is not partitioned. I don't post enough for that. I could have a partition for every blog post. <laughs> and Postgres partitioning would still scale. Uh, so these are interesting things. Uh, some of the really big things, however, we now have the ability to do what's called local partitioned indexes. Uh, if you were using the previous partitioning, you would know that for every partition you created, you had to create the indexes on that partition. Uh, to make sure that you had them. The advantages, you could have different indexes on different partitions. The disadvantages, you would forget to create the indexes and everything would be slow. Uh, if you now create an index on the master table, they will automatically cascade to be created on the partition tables with the same definition. So if you created an index on you know, the timestamp field of your master table, you now have an index on all your subtables for the same key, including newly added partitions will automatically gain this index. Uh, you can still add individual indexes to individual partitions as well as a performance optimization, for example. Uh, so this gets us, gets us part of the way. And it's a foundation for the next interesting feature here, which is cross-partition unique constraints and primary keys. Uh, as long as your partition key and all of it is included in the definition of your primary key or of your unique constraint. You can now create a unique constraint on the master table, which will then cascade and create unique constraints on all of your partitions, thereby actually guaranteeing that you have a unique data across your whole, uh, whole set of partitions, which you previously just couldn't do. You could sort of fake it, because if you if the partition key is all in there and you created manually a unique constraint on every partition, you would know that it was unique across everything. Postgres wouldn't know that. It didn't know that. It couldn't use it in planning. It couldn't use it in optimization or any of those things. Uh, so it lays the foundation, again, for even further improvements. Uh, Postgres 10 added range partitioning and list partitioning. 
11 adds hash partitioning. Uh, where you basically partition your table by an automatic hash value. Now there's a problem with this one right now, is it, it doesn't work with constraint exclusion. So if you use this now, all your queries will scan all partitions. It can scan the partition quickly. Uh, you go like, why on earth would I do it then? Well, there are other use cases uh, for partitioning and keeping sizes down. And of course, there are patches in the queue that will make this work with the optimizer and, and with actually running it, but right now that doesn't work. The idea behind it though, and the syntax will, will stay the same, is when we create our table, instead of saying partition by list, well, we say partition by hash, i. That tells Postgres, okay, you're gonna take an internal hash value of this column and create partitions for those. Then when you create the partition, the syntax is you say create table p2 partition of for values with modulus four remainder zero. That basically take the hash value of this, divide it by four. This partition will have uh, the, the rows where the remainder of that definition uh, divide is zero. And then you can create another partition for modulus four number one. Modulus four number two, modulus four number three. Uh, you can't just randomly change the modulus and say, now I want the partition for modulus three because you would get overlapping constraints. But you can do it on a power of two. So you can do subpartitioning and say, well, okay, there's modulus four. Now I need modulus eight for sort of the rest and split it apart. And the system will know that that works and it will calculate uh, which ones work. Uh, this goes similar to like the sharding question on the other hand. If you're using uh, hash partitioning, don't create just four partitions. Like that's probably not gonna help you. You need to create enough of them to actually scale the data out, which of course, again, right now, this is not a super useful feature since we can't optimize reads from it, but it's coming. Hopefully, it's coming in this version. If not, it's probably coming in the next version. Everybody always wants the next version. The next version is so much better. Uh, <clears throat> there is now partition-wise joins. Meaning if you are joining two tables that are both partitioned on the same partition key, that can be optimized in knowing that you know, partition one from this table can only ever match rows in partition one from this table, and they will be individually joined, and the entries will be appended to each other. Which is where it's really useful that we can do parallel append, because we can scan them individually. Now if you join a partition table to a non-partition table, it still runs like before, we can't do that, but it's the specific case where we have identical partition keys and we're joining on them. This is something that is by default not even enabled right now. Maybe in the release, but it's not now. So you need to actually change uh, a configuration parameter to enable this. Because, of course, there is a cost in doing it. There is a cost in analyzing this is the case. Uh, and it might be that we need further improvements before this starts paying off for real. Uh, we don't know that yet because we're not done yet. Postgres 11 doesn't exist yet. Which is a good point. We're not done. Right? Uh, we're not even close to be done. Like CF4, commit fast 4, isn't even halfway through. We've got more than half of it left. There are hundreds of patches that are still sitting in the queue. Um, so anyone who wants to review a patch, please review two. That'll make it so much better. But there are some interesting ones. Uh, I'm just going to go over a few of the ones that I think are interesting. I'm not going to say whether they're likely to get in or not, because that's really hard to say at this point. Many of them haven't been reviewed at all or, or in their latest form. Uh, at the SQL level, uh, there is, for example, a patch that supports serializable isolation level together with parallel query. Today, if you set, set transaction isolation serializable, you basically turn off parallel query completely. It's not there. If you need both of them, please review this patch. <laughs> or, you know, or at least test this patch. Uh, there are a bunch of different patches around the concept of SQL JSON, which is the SQL standard uh, syntax for doing different things about JSON. You know, Postgres has had JSON for a long time. These days, other databases have it. And there is, of course, a standard that's different from everyone. Uh, so that everybody now has to sort of refit that. And post, the Postgres JSON uh, syntax today is nowhere near the standard. It's very different. 
because as typical is, the standard is based around databases that don't have pluggable types and pluggable operators the way the Postgres does. Uh, but there are patches coming in to help with that. Uh, there is a large patch to support merge syntax. Okay. Postgres already has the special case of the on-conflict update or on-conflict do nothing, uh, but the merge syntax itself is a much bigger thing for, for sort of merging in data from different areas. Uh, so this syntax is in the list. Uh, we'll see what happens with it. Uh, there are more things around areas like partitioning. Uh, there is a patch with support for partition-wise aggregates. So like if you do a sum over a partition table, it could run the sum once on each partition and then put them together. This is not super different from being able to do a regular scan and using parallel query for it. So it's sort of similar to that, but being able to know about partitioning. So it's more about the system actually understanding what partitioning means and optimizing around it. Again, it's an example of how it's uh, using the infrastructure that went into Postgres 10 to put the optimization here into Postgres 11. Uh, we have two different ones. There is something called a runtime partition pruning and a faster partition pruning. Partition pruning is how the system figures out that it doesn't have to read all the partitions. Uh, and for example, the thing that's needed for hash partitioning to work well is to be able to runtime partition pruning. Right now, when you do a query against the partition table, when Postgres plans the query, it has to decide which partitions it's going to visit. And when it executes it, that's already been decided. And that's pretty hard to optimize for certain things. Like it might not know. And whenever it doesn't know, it will read them all. Now, these are both two ways of avoiding the read them all and moving the decision sort of lower into the system, closer to the storage, uh, to be able to use this optimization. Uh, and several of these are probably the fact that we have declarative partitioning syntax made it a lot. Uh, less flexible, like prior, prior to Postgres 10, when you did the manual constraint exclusion partitioning, you could create really strange partition rules, like really strange, that would be impossible to optimize by restricting the ability, or restricting the flexibility for you to create different ones, it's increased the ability for the system to optimize it. Uh, there is a patch for foreign keys on partition tables. Now this one has been much requested, right? And we already have support for unique constraints across partition tables, right? We added that already in 11. And the reason we really want that is to be able to do this. Right? Today, you can't have a foreign key pointing to a partition table. Hopefully, if this patch gets in, that's exactly what you can. And it will then know about the fact that it's a partition table, and it will be able to reach into the correct partition. It will only be foreign keys if they are on the partition key, Otherwise, they would have to scan everything anyway. But it's a pretty good start. And around foreign keys, there is also a patch uh, again. There was one many years ago that was never improved upon enough to improve uh, for foreign key arrays. So you can combine foreign keys with arrays. Saying I want an array of values, but each one has to be validated. Uh, there is a patch in the queue for alter table add column with a default value that doesn't take forever. Okay, right now, I'm sure you know, if you do an alter table add column, it's really fast. And then you say default one, and it rewrote your whole table with an exclusive lock. Okay. Yes, that's exactly what I was waiting for. Right? Uh, this is a patch that adds the ability to do that, and then sort of asynchronously in the background actually merge all the values and not lock your system. To let you add a column with a default value without killing your production systems. Uh, there's a patch for range merge joins, which is basically if you're using range types, say you have time ranges, and you want to join on the range. We haven't really been able to do that in an efficient way, <coughs> or directly with range types at all. You will be able to say, okay, join where the join clause is, these two ranges overlap, for example. Uh, there is one of those super low-level infrastructure patches that says uh, JIT compiled expressions and tuple deforming. Okay, that will show exactly nothing to your application, except it will be fast. Right? Postgres does a lot of expressions. Postgres does a lot of tuple deforming, which is sort of when we 
parse the, the data in our data structures. And putting a JIT compiler on all that, it uses a JIT compiler from the LLVM uh, system, can massively speed up some of these operations. Uh, because we do them repeatedly, and we do lots and lots of them, even in simple queries. Uh, but it has zero changes on the output or the syntax or anything. It's just pure infrastructure. Uh, but if it does get in, it's obviously something that's going to be worked on for a long time. But if the basics of it gets in, uh, it's going to be a definitely be a noticeable performance increase right there in any system that's CPU bound. It doesn't help you with I/O, but it does help you uh, with CPU. Uh, there are a few sort of a little bit more admin side. There is one to exclude unlocked tables from your backups. Uh, right now it's slightly silly because if you run a backup, it will include unlocked tables and temp tables. Then when you restore the backup, you restore all those tables, Postgres starts up and deletes them. And if you have large, like large data loading tables, they're not included in the backup anyway, why put them in the backup? So it's a simple filter. Uh, I think that one is pretty easy to get in. Uh, there are a few efforts regarding the page level checksums. Uh, there are tools for verifying page level checksums offline. There are tools for verifying checksums every time you take a backup, because you're reading the data anyway, so verifying the checksums is pretty cheap. Uh, it's all about finding your data corruption early. It, it's still data corruption, but you know the earlier you find it, uh, the more likely that you can do anything about it. Uh, and there is a tool for enabling data level checksums without wiping all your data and starting over from the beginning. Uh, there's something called chain transactions in the queue, which is basically I want to commit and immediately have a new transaction with no gap in between them. Like with an actual transactional no gap in between them, uh, not just latency. Uh, so that's a lot of things, right? And that was like 10 things out of I think 170 or something that are currently pending. Uh, and of course there's always more that has already been committed. right? Uh, but I don't have three days to talk to you about this. I, I only have the 45 minutes. Uh, there are lots of small fixes, lots of performance improvements. Uh, there's no way to cover them all. Uh, as I like to put in this, if there's a developer in the room who wrote something that I didn't mention, I'm sorry. You know, come talk to me, to me at the pub later and we'll see if we can make it up to you. Um, <laughs> I said come talk to me at the pub later and we'll see if we can do something about that. Yes, I do know your patch. <laughs> and for the rest of you, please help. Right? You can help. If you are a C developer, by all means, please join the commit fest. Help us review patches. If you're not the C developer, well, you can still help us in the commit fest by downloading the patches, applying them, testing them out, try to break them. Right? You don't have to know C code to break something. Run it in your environment and see, okay, here's this awesome new feature, you know, add default values with, um, and make it fast. And like find combinations of queries that makes it not work. Report those. Or report that I've tried 200 different combinations of queries and they actually all worked. That's also good feedback, right? The Postgres project really needs more people to get involved and help us with patch review and patch testing. Or maybe just check that the documentation in the patch actually matches what the patch does. Right? I know I've certainly made that mistake many times in my own patches, is you write the patch, you write the documentation, you fix the patch, and you forget to fix the documentation. But these are very simple things. It takes a lot of resources to review them. If we can share that across more people, it helps everybody. Outside of the commit fest, you know, download and test what is Postgres 11 today. Don't necessarily put it in production. But there are, uh, there are apt packages available if you're running on uh, Debian and Ubuntu. There are currently no RPM and YUM packages, uh, but I would expect them to be available within days. Uh, now these are nightly development snapshots. Don't expect them to work. As in, well, do expect them to work, but don't be angry if they break. Uh, they may not work, and they may, there is also no guarantee that if you upgrade to the next nightly snapshot, the old one might not upgrade. Like you might have to wipe your data and start over. So use them for things like that. But for example, if you have a unit integration testing that runs all the time today on you know, Postgres 9.6 or Postgres 10, well, if you can put up a second instance of all those tests that runs on Postgres 11, 
and let us know if we broke your application, that would actually be really valuable feedback to the Postgres project, right? Because we make a lot of changes, it's really easy to accidentally touch the wrong thing. And the more people that pound on this with queries that they know work in the existing versions, that helps us a lot. So please do look into that uh, and help us out with that as much as you can. Uh, with that, I think I'd better get out of here because you guys all want to listen to Vic close this thing and then go home. So thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Is there a brewery site for Postgres 11? Is there a what? A brewery site. Yeah, so there, there is one. Uh, the question is whether there is one for the developer snapshot. I'm not a user of that myself. I would assume there is one, but I don't actually know. Does anyone else know if there is a brew receipt for Postgres developer snapshots? Rats. Okay, I think there is one, but I don't know for sure. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks.